the battle Illuminati Sends the Charlie of the Ducks Is it Disney Mind Control? Is this MK Ultra Deluxe? I go Disney Gonna go show up on a star I go Disney To know what to chat for I go Disney Pinky old land, Pinocchio I go Disney Took another breath Bird Prince, the angel of death has come I go Disney We go from real to real I go Disney Oh, hear me and roll and no more feel I go Disney Ask about to move and learn that day I go Disney We teach a call to Upon a star I call Disney But you know what to chat for oh, I call Disney The new brand Pinocchio Yeah, yeah I call Disney It's a fun so I go I call Disney Please enjoy the show Hello, welcome to the Akat Disney podcast, where we have a look at all the secrets hidden in mouse towns like Buffington. Did I get the name right? <laughs> okay, good, good. I, I said I did my research. This is Matt here. Speaking up as always, it's Paranoid American. Howdy. Chicka, 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 da, da. <laughs> and we're going to have a little musical uh, scat and Interstitials? Interstitials? Is that how you say it? I don't know. That's one of those big words I can't use. That'll be the only one. I don't even uh, know if that came through clearly, but that's the only one. Okay. <laughs> this is Doug's first movie. Uh, I'll have to make my confession time. I assume this would be for the Gnome-mobile, but in Japan, Doug is not an entity whatsoever. I showed my wife some pictures and she was like, what the hell is that? Um, <laughs> I mean, so, did she recognize it as a human being? Kind of, except in Japan, they like characters that are like distinctly cute. So when they look kind of weird, like the Muppets aren't very popular in Japan because they're like, like Americans would be like, yeah, they're cute. But if you're just thinking from like a kawaii sense of the word, um, not mm -hmm. so much. They're, they're weird. So. Yeah, I spent like an hour plus last night trying to track down Doug's first movie to no avail. Torrents, no Amazon Prime, not in Japan. I found a VHS you could buy for like a hundred bucks, but I wasn't going to pay that or get it last night. So I will what have I to did, teach you the the ways of the seven seas, my friend, off of this. Uh, this podcast. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Be well, a Patreon only special. At some point. <laughs> <laughs> I probably should have started it before last night, to be perfectly honest. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, what I did do was make sure I was very well versed in the production history of the show. Uh, you know, I read the plot, I read a transcript, and I watched a few episodes online in a bizarre way where to skirt copyright, you're looking at a Samsung TV that's at a slight angle, and then Doug is playing on that. Uh, those were Disney episodes of the show. So I, I guess I was still missing the good stuff, but according you to the reviews of Doug's missing the good stuff. Yeah. But according to Doug's first movies reviews, I was probably watching some better stuff. I don't know. You can tell me if I'm right or wrong on that. <laughs> um, maybe I, so I want to lead this with that. The creator of Doug, uh, is Jim Jenkins and he is an amazing human being, one of the legends that, that helped raise me. He has no idea who I am, obviously, uh, but I definitely know who he is. And not just through Doug, but there was an old show on Nickelodeon called Hocus Pinwheel? Pocus. Oh, different well, show. <laughs> and, well, Hocus Pocus, and then there was also Pinwheel. Uh, on Hocus Pocus, 
I can't even remember what his character's name was, but on Pinwheel, he was like a little green monster that lived in the basement that loved weeds, uh, which I've actually seen come up in like the weirdest ways of like this. It was like a, a private commission someone had done. And it was Roger, who's like the bully in the show, Doug, and this guy, man, I wish it was like Professor, uh, like Professor T something or other. Uh, and anyways, it's it's a wild sort of stretch. And I didn't even realize it until uh, watching this and looking into it, that it's all the same guy that Jim Jenkins was involved in Hocus Pocus. He was involved in Pinwheel and he was involved in Doug. So he he raised me and he was involved in the Doug movie. And I think I don't know, maybe you've got some of the background, but I don't know how he went from the Nickelodeon version of Doug into the Disney ABC version, which then spawned the Doug movie. Like, was his name just attached or like, was he actively involved in the entire thing? Like, I've got no idea. It sounds like he was very actively involved with uh, the Nickelodeon one, of course. Uh, it ran for 52 episodes. And here, here's the catch. They ordered 60. So if they didn't finish the order, there was some kind of option at um, Disney finally came in and kind of scooped that up to put it on uh, ABC or whatnot. Um, at that point, just like, you know, George Lucas or Jim Henson, um, Jenkins is, you know, he's the, the, he can give them advice. He's an advisor, but it sounds like he's no longer like a, you know, day to day hands as hands on on the show. So, you know, which, once, which once is Disney's actually one of the, your stuff. <laughs> well, that's one of the big things that a lot of the original creators and like the old Nickelodeon, like 80s, early 90s, is that they had a lot of freedom to kind of like do what they wanted to do and that kids because i had a some inside baseball but when i first started my comic career i got to meet with some of the original owners and people that were working at klasky supo which did a lot of the other nicktoons and a lot of that feedback was that like kids legitimately got to run that network not in like a like they didn't show up at work with like a little suit or anything but that the feedback from kids and that the stories was like one of the first platforms that the stories were actually written for the kids, not just to sell them toys uh, and not just to like adapt things and make it dumber, but actually start with like, how can we make a like a smart and, you know, entertaining show just directed at kids. Don't dumb something down and just say, okay, now it's a kid's show, which is kind of like a lot of those early Disney shows, a lot, a lot of lost media. My best example is like the Dumbo live action show that was on Disney. I don't know if you've ever seen clips of it or heard of it before. It's, nope, a, little to me. Bit, <laughs> it's a little bit terrifying, uh, <laughs> but it's it's one of those like just dumbed down kids shows. It doesn't really teach anything. It's just like, ooh, you know, colors, movement, sounds, and it kind of stops there. So anyway, yeah, like the that OG Nickelodeon was like a special time uh, in like moment in time that no one really knows about. Yeah. Apparently uh, when Nicktoons premiered, they premiered Doug, Ren and Stimpy and uh, Rugrats back to back one day and uh, expected Doug to be the breakout hit of the three, which it did well, obviously it did between this and the Disney and you have seven seasons in a movie. That's, that's a success, right? Uh, I definitely knew the theme song as soon as I heard it. I was like, oh, okay, yes, I know that song uh, very well, even though I don't know the show, but uh, yeah, Ren and Stimpy got the critical acclaim, right? Because adults actually liked it and uh, Rugrats turned out to kind of be the hit. So Doug was kind of in this weird, like it's successful, but it didn't do quite as well as they wanted. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll talk about is just Nickelodeon in general, my growing up with it. I grew up in a house with no cable and I'm a little older, so I would have been more like watching 80s Nickelodeon. So I just remember uh, we'd visit my aunt's house in Delaware. I live in Atlanta, so it's a, a bit of a trip, but she had cable. So when I was a kid, it was like I was, you know, seeing like Pinwheel or Today's Special or things like that. And it was like some weird alternate universe children's programming that I was like, you know, just getting a, a, a short acquaintance with. So which kind of made it cool, right? <laughs> yeah. And you were you were like right at that cusp of when Pinwheel and there was another show called By the Way. I don't know if you remember this. You might even have to look it up to remember it. But if if you remember Pinwheel, you probably saw By the Way. And it was like a chick that kind of looked like 
um, a guy kind of look like Leo Sayer or or um, the, the jazzer size dude with the big <laughs> afro, uh, Richard Simmons. She kind of looked like Richard Simmons, but she always had a backpack, was always walking around and would just be like, oh, by the way, and like drop all these little like tidbits on people. But that was I don't know. That was like a really uh, show that I remember often popping up on Nickelodeon. And I think it was mainly because I was like, oh, my God, when is this one going to be over? Like, when's the when's the good stuff going to be on? Yeah, I, I just got an image and I'm definitely having a that's a when is when are we going to get to the weird clowns on today's special or something, right. you know, because <laughs> I only get to see this like once or twice a year, people, you know, <laughs> show me the good stuff. And, and I was uh, looking through this and I dug up some of the old Hocus Pocus episodes from Jim Jenkins. And I distinctly remember this being what, and I, when I say by Jim Jenkins, I think he just did some of the voices on the show Hocus Pocus. I don't even remember exactly what his role was. Um, but this Hocus Pocus show was like this big whiff of nostalgia that I haven't had since I was like five or something, but it's literally like a story, kind of a Harry Potter tale where a kid grows up and he wants to become a wizard. So he goes to a special school for wizards. And while he's there, somehow he gets sent on this quest into the future and on his quest into the future, he comes to modern day, modern day being 1980s. And he discovers like cars and he discovers television and movies and he becomes fascinated with it. And then he kind of like loses his way and wants to become a star. Like that's becomes his focus, even though he's a time traveling wizard, he kind of gets caught up by uh, TV shows. It's it's a really interesting thing. And I think part of that kind of shape, like it it plays into the the plot lines that you'll see in Doug and it kind of shaped my brain a little bit. Wow, I just confused myself utterly because apparently they before they had Hocus Pocus, there was also a show called Hocus Focus. <laughs> Hocus Focus? I, I don't know yeah. if that one is. No, when I did the search Nickelodeon uh, Hocus Pocus, it gave me mostly results for Hocus Focus, which looked even like older, like late seventies, early eighties. So, Maybe it was um, Hocus Focus. I can't it, remember. I, that, that's what I'm telling you. I think it's both. I think they were different shows on the same network. Just to, okay, you know, okay. dumb kids won't notice, right? <laughs> but I mean, that, I mean, there's some occultism for you right off the bat. Like Jim Jenkins uh, on that show was literally about a time traveling wizard that comes from the past. And gets obsessed with TV in the current. Yeah. So what I saw, obviously, I d- didn't watch the actual movie, but I I saw something was Trigger Man. Uh, um, no, <laughs> that's a good name for a superhero now. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, something with that. Uh, I saw a Christmas one, and watching it. So I guess being a, a again a couple years older, the thing I was watching along these lines was probably the Muppet Babies. <laughs> Because that was kind of the you know imagination base. There's like a little moral. There's a lot of weird asides and stuff. Not not that I'm not saying Doug's like ripping it off or anything, but I'm just like it had a similar flavor to me. Like if I were a few years younger, that would have been appealing to me for the same reasons. A little bit, I think. So here's where Doug stands apart. I think so. Rugrats and Muppet Babies, right? Because they're babies, it's almost an all ages show. Like you could almost be any age and sort of enjoy it. Um, to me, Muppet Babies was a little bit more juvenile. Uh, that's not a dig at you. Uh, I'm not calling you a, a well, baby for time. watching it, you <laughs> baby. No. But uh, and and Rugrats almost like skewed a little bit older. Like I, I mean, I can watch Rugrats now and still appreciate it and not feel the same as if I was watching Muppet Babies. I might be like, what am I? What am I doing here? Why am I eating cereal at eight o'clock at night watching Muppet Babies? It's fine if it's Rugrats though. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to put on Muppet Babies now. I, I would put on, you know, the proper Muppet Show, of course. Right. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we're all a gentleman of culture here. But the, yeah, the yeah. difference here is that Doug takes place in middle school. And unlike some of the other shows we talked about before, where it's like if you're watching high schoolers, like an actual high schooler isn't seeing a cartoon high schooler and relating. It's like the younger ones that are looking up to it. We mentioned this in the Goofy movie, right? Like it takes place in high school, but it might not actually appeal to like a 17 or an 18 year old. It appeals to the kids that are like looking up to those. But Doug taking place as a middle schooler, it was actually geared towards middle schoolers. And you could kind of watch it maybe in high school ish, maybe ninth grade, 10th grade. I'm not, you know, whatever age. I still love Doug, but it was unique in that 
like the the guy was the same age as the person that's watching it and then it's made for and kind of perpetually stayed in middle school so it kind of grabbed the attention of the slightly younger right like third fourth fifth grade that were like uh, cognizant enough to like follow the plot line of a tv show and the middle schoolers themselves and what doug went, went through there was like a little bit of morality but almost all of it was just the awkwardness of like growing up and interacting with people for the first time where it's not just like your your parents drop you off or you know you're in like ymca or daycare or something it was it, it kind of kind of like followed that initial quest i guess of like growing up in america particularly yeah and um jenkins thing i guess it, it said like when he was pitch meeting for the nickelodeon show he actually would ask for the moral like what is the main moral and we will you know retrofit the episode from that so if it didn't come across as heavy handed, I guess that's actually to their benefit because they were trying to put them in there intentionally. It's definitely not an Aesop's fables uh, s- style of storytelling. And um, I thought the location was interesting because it's like kind of a Simpsons thing where it's like, who knows where Springfield is? Sometimes it's in different places. It also seems like it's quite based on Richmond, Virginia, uh, which is uh, Jenkins hometown. <laughs> Yeah, and Doug looks pretty damn close to what I imagine uh, Jim Jenkins looked like growing up. So it feels very autobiographical, which I think probably adds to a lot of that like authenticity of it. So we're the, all like this has just been nonstop, you know, fifteen minutes of credit to, towards Jim Jenkins, just so that I can now say the movie was not that great. I mean, it was it got you know twenty eight percent on all the modern ratings and usually that's a good indicator that i'll love it and this i did love it i would probably rate this way higher than 28 percent, just for the record but it was maybe not as good as some of the tv shows even the disney version and that being said there's not a single episode of the abc slash disney new doug that i think holds a candle to like the og doug and i don't know how much of that is nostalgia versus actual merit but i mean It doesn't get, in my opinion, it does not get better than some original Nickelodeon Nicktoon style Doug. Like that is peak Doug. That seems to generally be the consensus that the later ones are a step down. Um, Because what you have Billy West voicing Doug in the first four seasons. And after that, you don't. So that that's a pretty big strike there. Not and and he wasn't fired. It was just um, it said the first four seasons, the voice actors would do it in the same room, reacting off of each other, whereas in the Disney seasons, they would do it remotely, which apparently had maybe was one of the reasons production moved from L.A. to New York uh, or something. So production moved. You have different people basically making the show, even though Jenkins is eh, still like involved, but not as involved because his 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 baby's been sold to disney <laughs> it, it honestly it feels like an absolutely completely different show and i even remember and here there's a little bit of scar tissue here just so my bias is on the table but i remember when the new doug got transferred from nicktoons to abc and watching that first season and just just like it hurt it really hurt because doug really was one of my all-time favorite cartoons i mean still is and I still like the Disney ABC ones, but I, if someone's like, Hey, let's throw on some Doug. I don't think anyone in the world like reaches to the ABC Disney DVD set. Well, it's like watching Simpsons season 11 to whatever they're on now, you know? Right. Or, yeah, or even three, bro. Like since Simpsons season three is, is a really good, uh, here's one that maybe, I don't know if people do this in Japan too, but like in America, whenever you get sushi with the fake wasabi and everything, they also give you like a little bit of pickled ginger and it's supposed to be to clear the palate between, um, dishes or between flavors. I don't know if that's just something that like Americans do to feel fancy. That's not real. No, that, that is correct. Um, actually what the, the purpose of in, in, in America, I was always told palate cleanser, but um, that's because a hundred years ago, because sushi, as we know, it's only like a hundred years old. You have to have refrigeration mm-hmm. stuff, right? So uh, the ginger was to settle your stomach if you got something a little rough in the fish. Oh, so you're actually supposed to eat and swallow the ginger. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're supposed to eat and swallow ginger. In fact, um, my wife <laughs> I'm and learning I, something new. I swear I use it like a wet nap for my tongue sometimes <laughs> <laughs> no when my when my wife and i are at a sushi place especially the conveyor belt sushi they'll have like a you know plastic 
box mm-hmm. of ginger and we'll we'll call ourselves the ginger thieves and eat half of it because <laughs> we like oh, eating ginger my mother-in-law makes homemade ginger which is like the bomb it's like pink not that um beige color <laughs> what makes it pink um uh her fur what did you ferment it or something uh the fermentation what, what, turn it pink or is it like from the agent that you use the ferment it i th- think it's from the fermentation um i i don't actually i just know like sometimes i'll walk up the stairs and there's like a percolating you know a giant jar of ginger giant well, jar of ginger that's hard to say <laughs> giant jar of ginger giant jar of ginger also yeah. all this to say that yeah the, the simpsons season three if at any point you're like man was this show ever good like put on Simpsons season three. That is the ginger. That'll settle your stomach and be like, <laughs> ah, okay, that's right. I'm not going crazy. The Simpsons legitimately was very funny and was like edgy and had social commentary. And then you like turn on, you know, season, I don't know, 40, 50, 8, 80, which season, yeah, whatever <laughs> season they're on. So yeah, so that just the, the older things sometimes are the better things. And I truly don't know how to separate the nostalgia, but Based on Doug in particular, it does seem the consensus is that the older is better than the newer. Yeah. I'm going to throw out Simpsons season five, by the way, for my personal um, baseline. But yeah, three is great, of course. <laughs> three three oh, to I'm, nine. I'm just throwing them out there. I just know it might not be season one that we're getting their footing. I yeah, think one is black. Yeah. And everyone had like blue skin. Like uh, what they hadn't nailed it down yet. And then they eventually kind of got their footing in three. So did Nickelodeon and Doug like kind of knock it out of the gate or did it take a little time? Cause it was what four seasons, 52 episodes. So in my opinion, it knocked it out of the gate from episode one. And in fact, uh, and I'm actually happy that I get to, to stay this since um, I guess you didn't know the original Doug and didn't get to watch the modern one, but the original pilot or first episode of the OG Nicktoons, Doug was Doug and Skeeter looking for a cryptid called the nematode. And ah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's and the plot line of the movie is they're looking for the uh, Lucky Duck Lake monster. So I almost feel like that's not just an absolute coincidence. Maybe it is. But that the very first episode of Doug plot line is tangentially related to the plot line of the very first Doug movie. Um, so that's like a nice if it's not a nod, if it's just a pure synchronicity, then I like it even more. <laughs> but either way, it's kind of a nod to that OG first episode of Doug. But it had all the charm and everything because in addition to Doug uh, like trying to find this nematode, he I think he's got... And it, they were cut into these like 11-minute episodes. So you'd get 11 minutes, commercial, 11 minutes, each one being a, a standalone episode. So also in that, that first batch of pilot episodes, there was one where like Doug goes to a dance and he like dresses up like a slug. Um, And this, again, is like a middle schooler. It was like the first dance. He had to like figure out how to ask the girl that he liked, Patty Mayonnaise, how to go to the dance. So it was like the the same things that a lot of kids were going through at the age group watching this. Yeah, the the movie does. It really seems like Disney was busy forgetting about Doug as hard as they could. Um, It was going to be direct video and it wasn't like a. It wasn't like a Toy Story thing where like, hey, this should be higher quality or it is higher quality or Lilo and Stitch. This this is really good. Let's win the theater. It was, oh, the Rugrats movie just came out and it's really successful. So how about instead of direct to video, we put it in the theater, out. meaning out. it was 100 percent intended to be direct to video. Uh, no one ever had a artistic thought that this should play in the theater. Um, so. It actually was kind of weirdly successful. It opened to fifth place and three and a half million dollars, which sounds terrible. Worldwide gross was 19 million. Not very good, but it only cost five million to make. So <laughs> they actually did make a profit on this movie. But, you know, everything's it's like, coming um, up Millhouse. Everything's coming up Millhouse. Yeah, it's all low stakes gambling with, with this movie, I guess. But I guess the thought was, oh, maybe if it really does Rugrats business, we'll be, you know, do, taking an Uncle Scrooge uh, gold right. bath. But so so <laughs> as someone that I think I was getting a little old uh, in a little long in the tooth for a Rugrats movie when it came out. But I do remember when it came out and it was a good movie. Like it was legitimately a feature length, you know, Rugrats movie. I don't know how much you're going to expect from a Rugrats movie, but it was pretty much that. And, and it didn't 
too much disappoint the doug movies as you're saying it like it could have been a direct to video type of thing and it might not have been held to the same standard as like a theatrical released movie i think the one thing that makes it stand out from like a normal tv show version of doug is that they got rid of some of the music that was like a little bit more acoustic and like like all the mouth sounds i don't know if that was jim jenkins too but all of that was like kind of the DNA from Doug. And I think some of it got lost in the the Disney ABC transfer process. But especially in the movie, they like they kind of this is like in a weird way, they like upgraded the music and they upgraded the sound effects to where it was like stereo. I think I, I even heard like some round sound effects on some of it. But it was like, this isn't Doug. Like what? Like where? Who did this? This doesn't feel right. Like it was out of place. Um, and I don't know if that was because it was retrofitted. They were like, oh crap, or it's a theatrical release. Let's throw some surround sound effects in here because it was like the sound was way more immersive than was happening on the screen at certain points. And it was just kind of jarring because part of the, the reason that I love Doug originally so much is it had like this like organic hand, like made sort of like homegrown feel to it and, and adding all that extra polish and like the Disney theater magic it like worked against it instead of working for it. No, it's weird how much a, a sound field can affect things. Uh, going back to the, the Star Trek, the motion picture, that movie was rushed to release and they forgot to put in the ambient bridge noise, you know, all the, all the beeps. And they finally put them back in like last year when they did a director's edition or whatever. And like, Oh, this actually feels right now. And it never, it always felt awkward and weird before. <laughs> So this is another example, just the other, the other end of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. No, I do remember like in the Mall of Georgia back in the day, p- uh, passing a Rugrats poster and just me being like, "What the hell is this?" Because you know I hadn't hadn't Nickelodeon on well ever, probably since the '80s, right? I think my parents got cable in like '97 or something. Finally, so, but, so does I, this mean you never watched the Rugrats growing up or Ren and Stimpy either? Ren and Stimpy, remember Ren and Stimpy had wider appeal, so I'd make friends tape that so I could watch a bit. So I'd see, I, okay. I had the Space Madness episode on VHS, right? But that that's the thing. Doug didn't get enough of a cool cachet where that was happening, and Rugrats would turned out to be the breakout hit. So, well, uh, it, it does make sense because again, like Rugrats deals with some pretty uh, out there, kind of like it's a legitimately a great series that holds up, like all the stuff that they get into holds up. And there's some a fascinating is Rugrats movie is not going to be in the Disney series, unfortunately. Um, but there's some amazing conspiracy theories about Rugrats, like that, that uh, Tommy Pickles is dead and that the parents are just trying to come to terms with it the whole time. Uh, kind of like a weird, like a uh, sixth sense sort of thing. But um the, yeah the that series was clearly made to where anyone could appreciate it again doug was more like once you got into the the later years of high school you might not care as much about it unless it was just like nostalgia reasons because the biggest thing doug usually comes into is like trying to get into patty mayonnaise's pants or at least winter heart because they're in middle school right but that's like that some of the highest stakes they kind of get into they sneak into a concert but again, it's like all about patty mayonnaise. So once you break out of like that being your whole world bubble of like the girl at school, it loses a little bit of appeal. Ren and Stimpy, on the other hand, holy hell, like I don't even know what age group is Ren and Stimpy actually for anyone that likes Aqua Teen Hunger Force or South Park or hardcore x-rated things that nobody should watch <laughs> could all be potential fans of Ren and Stimpy, right? I think uh he went on to do some like adult versions of ren and stimpy yeah 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 because yeah 1993 let's see i was 14 yeah i was you know wearing uh flannel shirts band t-shirts giant jinkos? jeans and playing in a punk band already oh and yeah jinkos bang was that did you have jinkos no 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 um uh, what what is is that jeans you don't remember Jinko jeans in the '90s? Yeah, the, the the huge tube jeans that like just went straight oh, down. Oh no, I like, didn't. I didn't go that hardcore. I just had like baggy jeans. Yeah, I, I didn't. But now that you're saying it, it's like recurring oh, in my you brain. You were a full poser. You were like a poser poser. 
Like you were just I was a punk rock poser. <laughs> okay. oh, no, no, yeah, yeah. No, well, there's a there's a line between skater and punk rock. Um, I tried <laughs> to skate once and I fell on my ass twice, so that didn't really happen. But yeah, I was playing bass in a band, so a gigging band, so that that works too. Yeah. So it's it, for for a skateboarder. Yes, I was a poser. But uh, anyway, that's where I was. So Ren and Stimpy made it to me, but I never even heard Doug. I think I heard the music i saw the face maybe i heard him talk a little bit and of course being in that time and place i was like that kid's a dork i don't want to see that <laughs> he was he was definitely a dork but uh one of jenkins things is he was kind of going for a peanuts vibe which okay now that makes sense you know i mean charlie brown's the, the biggest dork ever that's the whole point of charlie brown <laughs> i see that and I also think that Jim Jenkins, you know, there's maybe like an autobiographical Charlie Brown thing going on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you take something you like, you modify it to where no one can really tell. The, it's. I mean, obviously there's threads, but I would never look at Doug and be like, oh, he's ripping off peanuts, you know? So so um, since you didn't see the, the current movie, you did see some of the modern Doug. So what was the impression that you got from whatever episodes that you saw? It was like maybe I did see some of it somewhere in his house and just playing in the background. And like for me watching the Disney ones, it was very much like, oh, this is something that would be on the background and I would never quite engage. Sometimes you'd see something wild on the screen and that would catch my attention. Of course, I'm actively watching it on this weird YouTube videos. I am following the story. But I was like, if, if I if this was out in the wild, I it would just that best be on in the background for me. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess in the context, the, the movie, I do think if you if you cared enough about what the ABC Disney Doug was fully like, it's a decent approach to that one. Again, it's not the OG Doug. Like, just we'll go watch the OG Doug about Nematode and Doug's first dance. I think I think that's the combo of the pilot. I might be wrong about that, but if you just see the pilot of Doug, it pretty much never gets any worse than that. It might get a little better in some places, especially when they like sneak into the, the beats concert and a lot of the, just the interstitial uh, like scat style music is like, it makes the damn show. Like I swear you just get these little earworms in and yeah, you get the you know, vibe, you know, my, my like dog a- is going to take over if I, if I go on about it. But the, that very first episode is also really cool about the nematode because it was like, this is very heavy cryptid related and even in the movie uh it reminded me that this like 90s slash very early 2000s was like steeped in ubiquitous conspiracy theory everywhere like there there wasn't like a conspiracy theory like centric theme that would happen as often it was just like this ubiquitous thing that in almost every cartoon show uh, and I'm being like very inclusive here, but many, many cartoon shows, there was always like spy cameras or like men in black. Like they would just pop up and do things and you just be like, oh, yeah, that's that's the government there to like sweep up, you know, the story. And I don't know if I see that particular theme as often or as ubiquitous as it was in the 90s, even to the point where in this movie in Doug's first movie, uh, once the government essentially gets wind that they've captured this monster. And I'll, I'll give you a breakdown of the whole movie. I know you've probably read the synopsis, but I'll give you my, <laughs> my version of it too. But the once they capture this monster or know that there's a monster in town, like the ATF starts showing up. They take over the news. They take over the postal agency. They're like following people. Everyone in the whole town has like a little earpiece and like sunglasses. So it, it like legitimately, it's got this very heavy conspiratorial tone where everyone is out to get Doug and everyone's trying to like, you know, get him and it's the government that's after him and it's the news media and they're all in it together. And there's like seemingly no way out of it. And even the military general that runs like the corporate um, bluff, you know, town like the Bluffington name that he looks like George Herbert Walker Bush. He's got like the same kind of like Brown on top white side, kind of like hairstyling going on he kind of has a very similar cadence so i don't know it, th- this is a really good example not just of like occultism and uh conspiracy in the 90s but like how ubiquitous it was corporate aggression it's i mean this seems to be a thing here you know like the was it the bluff company is putting out like basically fake news about the the creature and stuff <laughs> And uh, Rocco's Modern Life had a very similar theme to this as well. I don't know. If, did you ever hear that, that one? Did you ever watch that? 
No, see, you know, at this point in time, I guess I, that's when I was getting into my weird Saved by the Bell obsession. But um, when I think back to cartoons, I, I'm just very much in that 80s vein of like, you know, the snorks and the gummy bears. Right. I, I think I think DuckTales is my sellout point because I saw some of DuckTales, but not that much when it was live on TV. That was kind of like right the time I was coming out. G.I. Joe Transformers. We were, you know, mainlining those, of course. So <laughs> this is so so this is such like a uh, interesting topic to me. And I, I promise we won't just like go on about this particular thing. But for me, it's such a weird aspect that like after outside of like the cartoons that we watched, you know what I mean? Almost everything once I. Once I graduated high school, it doesn't really matter what age you were either. Like our experiences are probably so much more similar because we go through a lot of the same motions and they're kind of separated. But when it comes down to like what cartoons did you bond with as a child, that op that has such a large aspect of like the real estate inside your mind, right? And like those, yeah, and it's like those, three year increments, right? Just a three right. year difference. You got people watching pretty different stuff <laughs> and and this like separates people in a way like the programming that we like the literal you know pro network programming that we were given as kids it adds just this tiny little barrier where i i don't know if you feel the same way towards me but like i feel like you're my my enemy and i want to kill you no i'm just kidding i i feel like <laughs> you missed out on something really really special just because you were born a little too early to appreciate some of the Nicktoons that that were just not catered to your age group. While I pretty much saw, I think, all the same cartoons and shows you might have seen growing up because they were repeats, but they were also like very inferior. I don't know how not to sound condescending in this way. <laughs> But man, the, the very late 80s, early 90s cartoons felt so much better than anything I saw come out of the 70s or 80s. Maybe. And, and I'm not a I'm not really like a label guy. Generation, generation. Maybe that's a good place to draw the Gen X millennial line. The debut of these three shows in 1993. If you're Nick in, you're I'm, millennial. I'm all in, bro. If you want to set the line at Nicktoons uh, debut, I think that could legitimately be like a milestone in time. And that's the thing. I, if I was a few years younger, I'm pretty sure I would have been hardcore in those cartoons, you know, whereas uh, I wasn't. I also, I grew up slightly too fast because uh, I, I told you I was playing a punk band. I was 14. Everyone else was 17 and 18. So I like went, I kind of socially went directly from um, elementary school to high school. <laughs> and I never went to a junior high, actually. So, yeah, it was first grade, yeah, seventh grade. You'll just never understand Doug at that sort of level. Yeah, yeah. I never went to junior high. First to seventh grade was elementary school, and then eighth to twelfth was high school. So uh, I, they're, I they're... do feel bad, but I'm sure you probably feel bad for me in other ways too. Although I think I've seen most of the filmation cartoons, and filmation kind of ruled the day in the the early '80s, right? Like that was all. Oh the yeah, yeah. He Gem and, and stuff, He Man yeah. and all that. Ultron, and, at least. Well, they distributed that, I guess, but. <laughs> and it, it wasn't bad. I'm not going to use the word bad for filmation. In fact, they were probably the best game in town. But compared to like some some 90s, especially Nicktoons, like it, they don't even freaking compare, man. Like, not oh, even I'm fully aware. I was watching some real crap. I mean, again, that's where I got maybe got started with into Disney stuff because I, in the 80s, I go to the VHS store. Here's an hour of Donald Duck cartoons. I'd watch those. Like I kind of understood when I see a Looney Tunes or a Disney cartoon, I would see them something better than they were, you know, generally showing after school or, or Saturday morning. That's a good point, man. D Disney was dominating up until Nicktoon kind of came along. Like that was the Disney channels where you saw a lot of that crappy child's programming I mentioned before. Like they didn't care. They were just like, hey, you know, grab, go grab an IP out of the closet, you know, turn it into a stuffed animal and just have someone do a silly voice for a half hour. We'll print money. Yeah, my cartoons were the Saturday morning ones because I didn't have cable. And um, and usually coming home after school, probably from the fourth or fifth grade on, it was like sitcoms because I got home too late for the cartoon. So it was, you know, Saved by the Bell, Growing Pains and, you know, stuff like that. The Happy Days was still playing syndication. I, maybe it does now. I don't know. I don't know what plays. Does anybody watch syndication? What 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 is TV anymore? Okay. <laughs> what is reality? Well, I did. 
I was hearing uh, some podcasting friends talking a day or two ago. They were like, what's the best jingle? You know, because the Oscar Mayer one, it tells you what they do. It gets the name stuck in your head. You know how to spell it now, blah, blah, blah. And they were saying, well, there's we don't really have jingles anymore in America so much. We, you know, uh, very uh, mallow. That's not the- so true. There's there's a few out there. I'm sure there's a few out there, but just the one that like every single person knows. But I was thinking, well, in Japan, they really rock the jingles hard. Like almost every commercial will end with like a three second or less little stinger. Like even think I, there's one commercial. I don't even know what the company does. You, do the whole commercial. Can you just can you just vocalize one? Yamada Denki. <laughs> that's it. Yamada Denki. Yeah, that's for the store Yamada Denki, the electronics store. <laughs> Do we what kind of what kind of actions coming our way now that we just said that? Uh, what action? I don't know. Um, there, there's a yeah. song. How if much, you're in, much, are they paying us for that? Oh, I hope so. Yeah, yeah. Except I don't know if they use it anymore. But that one they'd also play in the store, so that one would like just get hardcore stuck in your head. Uh, they'd play like the circus music theme, and then it would end with the stinger. But yeah, <laughs> uh, there's one commercial. Like I said, I don't know what the company does even, and it shows the sheet music, and the whole thing is like people like walking around singing this jingle, right? I'm like, I don't even know what this company does. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that one failed because unlike Oscar Mayer, I didn't actually know what they do. <laughs> That's like an uh, an American pharmaceutical commercial where you're just like, okay, you like there's a person in a bathtub and now they're driving a car, and now they're playing golf, and it's over. What like what does it do? <laughs> Complications of pain suit. Do not do this case. And well, they just have the fast talking guy at the end, right? Telling you why <laughs> why you really guys, like hiding all the suicidal thoughts that are gonna happen to you in the background. <laughs> yeah, speaking of adults and stuff, um I I, I a year and a half ago or something, I, I put on the too many cooks. I'm sure, you know, too many cooks. Well, mm-hmm. yeah. So, but we, we were like having a few drinks, whatever, and just kept playing and playing increasingly bizarre adult swim stuff that I'd never heard of. Like uh, one lady's like taking allergy medicine and it turns out like her doppelganger is like a zombie and like attacking her and kills her and takes over her family. I'm like what is happening? <laughs> Yeah, it, that, it, that, I, that was another really special moment in time that yeah some people are gonna miss that that's actually one of the the ones that i think people will watch in the future and not really understand that it was some, like it was more self-aware than they'll probably give it credit for and they'll be like this is so weird and be like it's weird but like we knew it was weird that's what made it good yeah i mean i guess that's the humor of the the you know, past 15 years has become so random and fragmented. Everything's an inside joke for whatever particular clique you're in. I mean, what was the last big comedy that everyone like kind of had a consensus on popular consensus? I mean, all in the family. <laughs> oh, oh, we're going that far back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I, I was thinking what, what are, like, I don't, I'm not in that. I don't like the hangover much, but that was a massive comedy, right? They even show that in Japan, which is rare. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I guess, I guess you would probably be the better litmus test on this on like what American movies have made it all the way to Japan uh, and were also successful. It's it saddens me that The Hangover is one of the biggest examples you've got on your mind of comedy. Any, that, anything without Bradley Cooper in it by any chance? Because <laughs> usually they don't show comedies at all in Japan. So are you not allowed to laugh in Japan? No, humor is just like the last thing to translate. If you're reading comedy with subtitles, it tends not to be so funny. Fair point. And then the humor is different. Um, yeah, just the style of humor. Like uh, J- Japan like, has little to no even concept of sarcasm. So if it's sarcastic humor, nobody gets it. <laughs> Real, well, we, yeah, I guess I guess because sarcasm almost implies a little bit of disrespect. Um, which like I, maybe that's not the right way to phrase that, but. I almost feel like people in Japan might be too respectful to be sarcastic. That might be part of it. Or yeah, it's just, it's just a weird disconnect where like, I, I honestly don't understand sarcasm so well anymore. <laughs> I've like lost my, and you know, in high school. Yeah. Super well, sarcastic. This is the, the worst definition. This is not from Merriam Webster, but I guess the way that I interpret sarcasm is like, it's a lie that, that is supposed to be an obvious lie that everyone knows is a lie. And that only an idiot wouldn't realize it's a lie. And that's what makes it funny is that you imagine an idiot in the room that hears you say it and takes it verbatim. And that's kind of what makes sarcasm work. But 
if not everyone is of that mindset of like, oh, you just said a lie out loud and you know that you're lying because like, like we're both smart enough to, to pick out the lie and know you mean the opposite of what you just said. Oh man, the, if there was an idiot here, they would totally fall for that. It would be so funny. It's kind of the like the background and explaining jokes is the funniest way to get them across too. Yeah, yeah. So just yeah, like um, I mean, you'll you'll always see like high school guys like grabbing each other's crotches and stuff. I'm like, man, and dude, that wouldn't work in the states when I was in school. At least <laughs> get your ass kicked. <laughs> Wait, in Japan? <laughs> yeah, they think it's funny. So. <laughs> Well, I mean, they slap each other on the ass here. Yeah, yeah. And I, I guess they just seem more handsy than I remember American students. Yeah, so, so in America, that would be considered a, a little bit over the line. Uh, what we do here to remain uh, strong alpha men without, you know, <laughs> dipping our toes into that that pool is that you use the, the brim of your hat and you whip it at somebody's uh, dick. And oh, as long okay. as... As long as you don't personally make contact, and that's kind of a weird thing. You can use towels, you can use sticks, you can use hats. Like you can still touch all your friends' junk. You just can't do it with your actual hand because that's like that. It's a little, you know. No, they're perfectly happy to to go handsies on that. So I've had a few weird junior high classes to teach in my past. <laughs> like, guys, for the love of God, just stop. <laughs> <laughs> I think all of that is actually a crime that could have you sent to jail now in American schools, even if it's just like kids goofing around. I'm pretty sure they'd be registered sex offenders. We're pretty yeah. zero tolerance now in the States. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I, Japanese schools don't have metal detectors or anything, and I've been led to believe a lot of the American ones do now. So <laughs> so what, what Matt's saying out there is that if there's anyone that's got a itchy trigger finger, you could actually pave some new ground in Japan. They usually get stabby in Japan. You'll read about okay. stabbings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is, you know, there's occasionally horrible stuff that happened uh, a few years ago that some guy burned down the um, a animation studio in Kyoto during a packed business day. So that was pretty raw stuff. But yeah, yeah, you'll read about someone just having a crazy stabbing, but you very rarely read about a shooting. Uh, yeah, the, the yeah, you don't have, have to try and compete. We we got America's got this on lock. Don't even yeah. try to compete here. You got it unlocked. Like like England, you know, the police have to go to back to the station to get a gun. <laughs> <laughs> but farmers, farmers, I just imagine the Benny Hill song going on. A yakety sax is playing in my head right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> But then farmers can go to the city office and they can um, get a rifle from the city office to, you know, scare away the crows and stuff. So, you know, when there is a purpose, I guess there's a way. <laughs> I, uh, get, I couldn't imagine an American farmer driving to a government building to check their rifle out. It's like the <laughs> antithesis of <laughs> yeah. an American farmer. Yeah, when you say it out loud. I mean, we have <laughs> we have firing ranges, so you, you can be a gun person, but. Um, the weird thing is they sell these like really detailed replica guns. Again, you wouldn't see it in America because everyone would assume that's a real gun, right? But in Japan, they have like maybe slightly smaller than the real thing, but very accurate model replicas with no like orange thing on the front or anything. It looks like a proper uh, non functional, slightly smaller. I don't know. I've uh, maybe they shoot air darts or something. Uh, <laughs> uh, not not my hobby, so I haven't looked. But, you know, I've walked by storefronts and see that sort of thing. I'm like, well, there's a gun shop in Japan. Oh, oh OK, I see what's going on here. <laughs> it's what it's wild in the States here, too, because like the real version of a particular uh, firearm will be basically the same price as like the airsoft version of that exact same firearm. Uh, so it's just like, you know, it's just like, what age are you? Are you 12? You get the plastic one. Are you like, I don't know like 16 maybe you get the airsoft one and then once you get to 18 you graduate to like the real version no i do i do remember because um my friend and i you know we we're making vhs camcorder movies and stuff and right around 1990 is when you could not get realistic looking toy guns anymore because we wanted realistic toy guns because we were trying to make our little movies thanks a lot clinton that's right Taking about the way our our realistic looking guns. that would have been daddy bush actually yeah blame daddy bush for that it's all the same thing anyway isn't it it is all the same thing they're all skull and bones they're all bohemian grove let's see my 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 gun is a rifle that my grandfather gave me when i shot it at a range and then it i think it's been a hat rack for the past 30 years (laughs) 
I, I, I mean, I was a boy scout. I had fun. Uh, you know, shotgun shooting. That's fun. Although you get end up with a giant bruise on your shoulder when you're finished, but unless you do it all the time, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Then you just develop a really thick callus all over your chest to just uh, prevent <laughs> that from happening. And we did lots of rifle shooting in, in the Boy Scouts at summer camp. And I don't know if they still do that or not, but <laughs> I th- no, it was I've BB. actually replaced that with pronoun pronouncing. Okay. Cause it was BBs for a while. And then, and then, it was proper rifles for like black powder or whatever. So yeah. Back when, <laughs> back when men were men. <laughs> back when boys were boys. Boy Scouts. <laughs> so so to, to wind it back towards Doug a little bit, there's I, I'll give you my my little note breakdown and then we can pick it apart a little bit and then just talk about general Doug and cartoon stuff some more. So so for whatever to fill in the gaps of whatever you already read right it starts out and just like the original pilot doug they're looking for this uh lucky duck lake monster and it's a little bit expositiony it's kind of like in the first five minutes it's like oh here's what the goal of the movie is doug and skeeter looking for this this cryptid that's hiding out in the lake and they get bullied by roger and his friends which is sort of like the the Nelson, right? Roger in Doug is sort of the Nelson in uh, Simpsons in a way. Yeah, yeah, so, I did pick up. He, of course, I mean, I guess all these people tend to show up in most of the cartoons. So I was introduced. And, and this to them. also relates to that pilot episode because the same plot in the nematode episode is that when Doug and Skeeter are camping out at this lake, they're not looking for the nematode per se. They're like afraid of the nematode. And uh, Roger and his friends, the same people that are in this movie, they kind of like play a trick and make, you know, try and scare Doug and Skeeter into thinking of nematodes out there. And side tangent note, a nematode is act is a real thing. It's not a huge, big monster. Uh, nematodes are kind of similar to flatworms, except they um, their bodies are built a little bit different. It's like tubular. So like food comes in the mouth and just goes straight through and comes out the back, just like a, like a tube. You know what I mean? No, so uh, but apparently they are like the most plentiful things on the planet uh, in, in most biospheres that there's like 60 billion of these for every human that's on the planet. They're like more plentiful than ants. They're also found in the most amount of biospheres. There was some quote that I, I'll paraphrase that I saw on Wikipedia earlier, but it was like, if you were to wipe out the entire planet, if you got rid of all humans and dogs and livestock and plants and just everything, if you got rid of everything except for the nematodes, these little, these little like wormy looking things um, that you could theoretically an alien could like come to the planet and observe all the nematodes and use that to kind of reconstruct what was in the earth originally, like where all the trees were at, where all the humans were at, because every one of us and every, every living thing on the planet kind of leaves behind this nematode footprint because again, they turn anything around them into a, like a living biosphere. Like these are the little things that can survive at like the lowest points of the ocean and at the highest pounds uh, in, the, in the in the mountains and like related everything. to tardigrades here or in the same classification at least and i'm seeing lots of pictures just on the weekend i'm just scrolling my mouse around and seeing horrible pictures <laughs> yeah of the little <laughs> nematodes so so and other it's things just, it's just interesting that the the cryptid that everyone's afraid of in the first episode of doug this nematode is actually a real thing but it's like a microscopic thing and it's not a big monster you'd see but like Doug is right that and they are right to be afraid of the nematodes. They're all over the freaking place. So in, in the movie, since they're going after this uh, lucky duck lake monster, it's not a nematode. This one is like a full blown kind of like a reptilian looking thing. It's like a little combination of like a dinosaur and a frog in a way. Uh, and so they find this monster, this this lucky duck lake monster and they bring it to either Doug or Skeeter's house and it starts to eat a book. I think it's at Skeeter's house and it's eating Moby Dick by Herman Melville. So they name it Herman Melville. Like that's the name of the monster is Herman Melville for the rest of the movie. Um, they, they try and hide it and unable to hide it. They dress it up like a girl. And again, in typical like 90s fashion, there was this like trope, right? That if if you just put a wig and lipstick on anything, if it were Alf, if it were, you know, uh, Drew Carey, if it were like anybody at all, 
it just becomes a woman. Like no one even questions it. They show up to the office and it's like, oh, the new girl in the office. So they kind of do that in Doug. They put lipstick and a wig on this monster and everyone's like, oh, do you see the new girl? And I guess everyone's got a crush on her. Uh, uh, Patty gets mad at Doug because she thinks that Doug is like hooking up with this monster with the wig and the lipstick on. It's called Hermione because it's the female version of Herman. Uh, which uh, it's just classic 90s. I don't know. I, I don't think it would still be used as a trope today. Like, oh, you just put a lipstick and, you know, wig and everyone. Well, I don't know. Maybe you do. I'm not going to I'm not going to go any further onto that. But yeah, I actually heard an interesting thing that um of comedy around that time, like it, that has more than one thing. Uh, the only one that didn't really take that step weirdly enough was Austin Powers, which did a lot of other th- things that were, you know, gross, but. They didn't. They never did that, which is interesting. <laughs> really, there was never a cross-dressing character they, in Austin Powers. Were, well, they, you know, they, his thing was just being weird. I guess you know. I, I think the third one might have like a little bit of that, but they don't really. You know, it's mostly fat bastard and gold member, right? So, <laughs> I'm a fan. I like. I like the whole series. I'm not going to talk anything bad about anything Michael Myers has been in that I can think of. Love Guru. <laughs> I don't hate yeah. Love Guru, man. I think actually Love we didn't Guru hate is- it. Uh, yeah, we didn't like it, but we were like, okay, the sports casting stuff is funny. Um, was doing Colbert, and there was there was one other thing that we did think was funny in there. Um, it, <laughs> let me just say, I'll just say it this way: if you rewatch the Love Guru and imagine that Michael Myers, the person, the actor, has hate in his heart towards Indian people it makes the movie a little bit funnier if you just assume that he's like intentionally being as offensive as he possibly can, as if he's just like drawing Muhammad everywhere. Uh, and like, you know, you know what I mean? Like if you watch it with that mentality, it's a little bit funnier. If you imagine that he's mean spirited about it. Oh, the book titles. That was the other thing I thought that was like legitimately funny in there. Was it? Um... It was all like suck my teat and like, you know all the all the funny puns. oh, oh, oh the, the the book titles was it uh if you're happy and you know it think again i, I really like that <laughs> That's right, it was like qbc meets uh like love guru which actually if if they were re-release not the same exact acting but the concept of love guru it would actually make more sense now i think yeah, I know yeah, that probably. we had Miss Cleo and all that, but it feels like s- somebody has turned that freaking dial up to 11 over the last like 10 years or so. Now I'll stand my ground on Wayne's World, which does Wayne's World do that? I, I don't remember. But yeah, yeah. I mean, as you're explaining, dressing up Herman as a as a girl again, I'm thinking back to Saved by the Bell or Zach Morris is the new girl now, you know, <laughs> right, our bosom buddies was another really big one with uh, an early Tom Hanks thing, right? Where yeah, they try to yeah. get into like the, the cheaper girls housing by just dressing up it and everyone just accepts it. Like all you have, literally all you do is put on a wig and lipstick and maybe shave, maybe not even shave. And everyone's just like, Oh, don't talk about her whiskers. You know, I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> Maybe the 80s was more accepting of a time than the 2020s. Who knows? And they did it for three years, three seasons of, <laughs> two, excuse me, two seasons of Bosom Buddies. Okay, 48 episodes. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, remember yeah. when I was a kid thinking that was the funniest stuff, you know? Uh, <laughs> there was, a, you know, there was another then, but... show. I think it was a British show called Bosom Buddies that had nothing to do with the Tom Hanks version and I only know about it because they made us watch it in some English class because it was based on a book I think called Bosom Buddies but it mm. it changed my entire I just like now like where, where I can talk about Doug and you're a little bit lost because you missed out on that part of your childhood people talk about Bosom Buddies and I always conjure up this stupid British show about a girl that has some other friend and I don't get to conjure up the Tom Hanks version where he's got like, you know, he's cross-dressing. No, no, that's that's what I got. That's where I first. Yep. That was my first exposure to to Tom Hanks, I guess, because he was more of a comedy guy in the 80s, wasn't he? <laughs> so. So. Uh, so, yeah, they, they find the monster. They dress the monster up like a girl at school. That was where that tangent started on. And then. um they they kind of decide that they're going to tell the media. They're going to call the media and say, hey, we found this monster because the premise, which they don't really dive into, and I'll bring this back up towards the very end here, but that it's a monster because the lake is polluted. 
and the lake is polluted knowingly by bluff the you know the namesake of bluffington so like and who's also the father of one of doug's friends which makes it kind of weird bb bluff but so the you know papa bluff essentially is knowingly causing like a silent spring episode dumping chemicals into the lake and dumping those chemicals into the lake creates the monster that's the subtext that i got from the movie they don't explicitly say it exactly like that like it doesn't go a plus b equals c but that's why they all want to like squash this monster story because if the monster comes out and they and the people of bluffington know that the monster came from the lake then i guess in their minds they'll just put together that pollution caused this monster to be created so anyways the the whole plot at this point is now bluffington as a city and you know um mr bluff is now like hell bent on getting this monster and not just getting rid of it but he wants to stage like a false flag kind of thing where he makes it look like the monster is attacking the city and he's going to come in and save the city from the monster to kind of kill two birds with one stone one he becomes a hero and two, he kind of sweeps the whole like polluted lake monster thing under the, the rug. So that kind of comes to a head where uh, Roger gets a mech robot that looks just like the the evil robot in RoboCop. What is it like this? ED209. What is it? <clears throat> ED209. ED209. So he gets a, a little robot that kind of looks like ED209. And then during this big uh, moment when they're supposed to do this false flag operation, the AV nerds at Bluffington school, they like dress the ED 209 to look like the monster by giving it like a dress and stuff, like make it look like the, the female monster. So then all of the guys that are inside all these paramilitary and the postal worker and uh, the, the news media guys, they all take out these guns and start blasting at this monster. What's actually the ED-209 mech robot thing that's dressed up like the monster. They take it out, and then the, the Bluffington realizes, oh, crap, that was just this robot. It wasn't actually the monster. They try to chase the monster down. Doug and Skeeter follow it back to Lucky Duck Lake and let it go into the lake, and they're basically like, ah, you'll never find it now. And that's kind of the end of the movie. But the the weird part is that if we're saying the monster was created because the lake's polluted and they just send the monster back into the polluted lake, aren't they kind of like killing it? Aren't they doing it like a disservice to say like, Hey, this thing that caused you to mutate, just go back in there. You're safe again. Like Hmm. it seems like it, like no one ever finds out about the polluted lake. And if they do find out about the polluted lake and they try to fix it, aren't they removing the lake monsters habitat? Like it's a sort of a lose, lose situation for the monster in this movie. Maybe the monster's going to evolve and it's muck. That's what Godzilla does. He goes back into the ocean. Of course, the ocean's a lot bigger, too. But <laughs> Well, also, Godzilla is not necessarily, like, friendly to the city. Not all the time, no. There are, there are hero Godzilla movies as well. But, yeah, yeah, you never, you never know what mood Godzilla's going to be in. How does a hero Godzilla navigate his way through a city? Does he, like, tiptoe and, like, shimmy through the buildings so that no one gets hurt? I, I guess they have to clear the way a bit, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so if like if you're not looking out, he's stepping on you. I mean, if you haven't seen 2004's Godzilla's Final Wars, I would direct you there for the most insane, entertaining Godzilla movie. I have, I've only seen the OG Godzillas, and I saw the Matthew Broderick remake, which which I understand is the best Godzilla adaptation so far, right? <laughs> Um, eggs? yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you seen Shin Godzilla? Or now that we have Godzilla minus one, uh, both of which are pretty good, Shin Godzilla is definitely kind of cool. I haven't seen either. <laughs> okay, I'll recommend Shin. Shin is weird because half of the movie is just people like arguing in conference rooms, it's it's like how bureaucracy like doesn't move even when there's a monster approaching the city <laughs> like there's japanese bureaucracy is still too and Hold nobody on, wants we to need change. one more zoom meeting to figure this out <laughs> right 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 everyone and, uh, make sure your cameras are on it's, it's and important I, have, <laughs> I haven't seen minus one yet but um uh, one i have people telling me i need to but i've been too chicken to go watch it and with no subtitles, just in pure Japanese, right? But uh, that one apparently is much more emotional, whereas Shin Godzilla is very not emotional. It's all weird bureaucracy and and stuff. Well, like like and, you you have emotions for Godzilla. I guess I haven't seen the new one. Uh, okay. 
But Shane Godzilla, the other thing that's kind of fun about is all of the scenes in the conference rooms and the government stuff is done like with like moving cameras, quick edits, lots of energy. (laughs) And then when the Godzilla scenes are like slow, stately shots. (laughs) I kind of like that. That's kind of cool. Oh, it's great. It's, 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 yeah. I mean, it's that easily ranks up with the original uh, for that. that, um, I don't know if you've ever seen the show Succession. It was like an HBO thing. That's a, I, one of those things where it's like, I probably should, but I haven't, you know? You should. I do think you should. You probably hear that uh, more often. It usually puts yeah, people I, away. I do, but I've heard a lot of people say, watch a session. <laughs> a really cool thing about Succession, uh, and, I, and this is my own observation. I saw like an article and I was like, actually, I agree with that. So now I'm just going to repeat it all the time. But that Succession is unique, not just the story aside, but that the camera itself becomes a character. Like they actually make sure that the camera is usually at like an eye level. Like, so if you were in a room and like having dinner, they will have it like in a dinner scene and they will place the camera right where someone might be sitting. And almost all the camera movement is like looking around the table the same way that maybe someone that were sitting at that table would be looking around, but it's done in such a very subtle way that you kind of feel like you're, you're a character in the show, but it's just because of how well the camera work is sort of done to emulate you being in the show as opposed to just the normal shaky, you know, hand cam or the, the typical like two or three camera setups. All right. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll have to put that somewhere on the list. I mean, I have like unopened TV sets here, so. <laughs> okay. So I got a few conspiracy and occult um, specific observations for the Doug movie in particular, maybe Doug in general. So we already covered the cryptid aspect pretty much in detail. There's a few other aspects of that in other episodes, but with the movie and the pilot, it's all about Doug finding a cryptid in his town. So right off the bat, Doug's got like a pretty high on the occult conspiracy scale. Also, like I mentioned in the movie, everybody turns into an ATF agent at a certain point. Everyone's spying on Doug and there's cameras all over the place An ice cream truck drives by and like cameras come out of it. Like every, literally everyone in his entire neighborhood becomes an ATF agent and they're just trying to spy on him and find this monster. So that, that conspiratorial aspect is very deep in this movie, which automatically gives it a couple points in my mind, which almost no one else would give points for, but that's, that's a big part of it. And then your um, local cryptid too. It's not just the general like you know. There's Bigfoot all over the place, but the uh, he's like the Florida skunk ape, or like the the you know Frogman of wherever the hell Frogman's from. Right, right. So you know, like uh, find finding the stuff in your own town is kind of what what Doug's doing here. <laughs> the, we also have a nod here to Quail Man, um, which is Doug's alter ego superhero, and. Now, in retrospect, like I can't not think of Quailman as Doug's like MK Ultra Project Monarch ego that was probably tortured into him at some point, and he's probably got some really weird repressed memories that Quailman is taking up. Uh, but it's it's also just one of those things that was very typical, and maybe even still in a lot of ch- like child's programming. But this concept that you can have these alternate personalities, like even though you act this one way you might be a superhero underneath it all. And just instilling that concept of like a complete juxtaposition, like you can be the opposite of what you are normally. You could be the opposite. It's true. And it's somewhat empowering, but it's also MK ultra as hell. (laughs) And you were saying trigger man. Did you mean quail man? Or is there a trigger man? Uh, Trigger too. Man was him watching a movie, but okay, but kind right. of maybe seeing that. No, no, it was definitely Trigger Man. But um, and he's got the slick back hair, and he like, yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. Okay, yeah, so I saw that. So, but that's because I had the same thing. Like, oh, I see that. Here's my own version. <laughs> right. Well, that those are like him watching a movie and then relating to being that character. The same thing is that when he would listen to like a music video of the Beats, which was like the local rock stars of Bluffington then he would always imagine himself as being like a rock star, one of the beats. That was kind of one of the cool things of Doug is that he'd always end up daydreaming himself being this like other character, but he'd always go back to being the exact same Doug. Yeah, I did see the clip, which I think was from the Nickelodeon era of uh, apparently there's a a song that was a a kiddie sensation uh, banging on a 
what bang oh yeah <laughs> banging on a pan or something yeah He's yeah like banging on garbage cans yeah <laughs> yeah so i did see that clip which is like i think i have it on one. vinyl i i didn't grab it right before we started but somewhere behind me in this absolute chaos uh is a uh a cut like a limited edition uh beats from bluffington color vinyl uh, <laughs> that has like the seven top songs from the original doug series and i've have listened to it unironically just you know doing things oh so. i just yeah i mean we pick up things like this hold on i got fifty again last week we're gonna we're about to see one it's like the, i don't know what this is but i just like saw it and i was like okay that that sounds weird and entertaining we've we got a cd t- tokyo disney's fantalusion <laughs> it's like okay for 50 for 50 cents i'll bite you know <laughs> is Fantalusion the pl- the exhibit that has the Lucifer at the end? Let's look at the last track. Uh, the evil. No, nah, it looks like Jafar is the main villain in this one. It, it was in Tokyo in the mid '90s as kind of their Main Street electrical parade, and then I think they moved it in a, a truncated form to Paris after that. Oh, you're thinking of Fantasmic, I think. With, with oh yeah, and then the dragon burned down a few years ago that was exciting yes yeah, so we don't have any of that in orlando we don't have right. the, the satan stuff we got the subtle satan stuff oh i only saw the subtle stuff i've never been to california <laughs> <laughs> or not disney california i should say i've been to california once <laughs> uh so so the quail man mk ultra aspect there's also an aspect here a little bit creepy if you really if were to follow it to its logical conclusion but this guy named guy in the movie uh, who's basically like the school uh, newspaper editor? Although I just I'll just say this once in the show he comes across like he's twenty or something or like he's very like he's much older like he's not a middle schooler he seems like he's at least you know seventeen eighteen but Patty like looks up to him and he becomes this like conflicting love interest that Doug has to kind of like save her away from but there's an actual scene when he pulls out a disco ball and he spins it. And he's like, you will come with me. And she gets mesmerized by it and goes with him. And the implication is like, he wants to make out with her. He wants to bring her to the dance. He wants to kind of like, you know, schmooze on her a little bit. But he hypnotized her in order to do that, which again, in like modern day society, that would kind of be like an assault move. Like that would be like very problematic, unethical beyond just like oh hey here's something we're going to portray in a cartoon as an acceptable way to get somebody on your side just hypnotize them just mentally uh sort of like you know trigger their their uh traumas and make them do something so i thought that was interesting especially on the tail end of like the quail man project monarch link (laughs) sort of a um mind control midsection then i guess (laughs) And then there's uh, there's a scene where they're like imagining this monster that's like taking over and the, they actually use TV to make the, the like reptile sick, the big monster sick. So they play TV and it gets so this big reptilian gets so sick from watching TV, it like vomits Doug back up and he like stinks like monster. Ah. So I just thought that was a cool little like nod to. You know, TV is like the real problem here. Well, I mean, cathode ray televisions and VHS would give me like migraine headaches. So I, that's one uh, thing the, I like about the modern hertz world. Cycle? Is that what it is? Uh, something about that. Maybe the fuzziness of VHS and you put it all together and I would just get. I remember like not being able to watch things for too long, which is probably good. But <laughs> really, that's kind of interesting to me. Did Is this in the States and overseas? Was it just in the States? Was it just overseas? Both. Um, once. Oh, uh, yeah. The hum, I guess. Analog TVs have kind of a very high pitched whine. Yep. That that was part of it, and then the fuzziness of VHS. So if I was watching that, and yeah, if I go in a room now with an analog TV, I can't stand it because I, you know, I haven't been around them for so long. So if I do happen upon one, I'm like, oh my god, you know. <laughs> Some people like that's like the uh, the real way to to consume media. Still, there's some purists out there. Especially no, in like yeah. the retro gaming scenes, like the NES and Genesis. It's like no one wants to play on anything other than a CRT. Yeah, well, if that that if you don't hear that and it doesn't bother you, then it might be cool, right? But for me, it's like 
like kind of torturous. Like I always leave my Bluetooth off because I feel like when my Bluetooth is on, I feel slightly nauseous. And sometimes yeah. I'll be like, I'm feeling a little bad. And I'll look in like my phone's updated and turned it back on. I'm like, oh no, you know, turn it back off. <laughs> So I, I will talk. I will talk crap about Bluetooth. Yeah, <laughs> maybe give yourself a, a shot with like a Faraday blanket. See if you actually notice any sort of like substantial effects from that. I don't know if you've ever. If, I'm, I'm sure you know what what a Faraday blanket is just by the name of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I can work that out. <laughs> but no, I, I don't think I've experienced one. So yeah, who knows how much soup I'm I'm dealing with? Um, when I pass, they had. Do we have like elect uh, invisible dog fences in the states? Yeah. Okay. So I, sometimes I can note where the invisible dog fence is. Keeps me out of people's houses, you know. <laughs> Un- until you figure out how to take that that collar off, and then you can right. go anywhere you want. Well, I do remember uh, walk uh, one of my routes to work, and, and uh, this was a few years ago. Maybe I don't have it anymore. But I would like start wincing a little bit when I was passing this house because I knew I was about to get a boop in my you know as I went by it, which was not that enjoyable <laughs> there's a uh, another i i don't know if this falls under conspiracy theory or like pseudoscience or but there's this concept of people that are sensitive to electromagnetic frequencies and they like there's a certain place here in the united states that i guess is like away from a bunch of power lines and people go there because it's like this dead spot where cell coverage doesn't necessarily reach as well and like wi-fi signals and and apparently a lot of people that claim to be highly sensitive to like EMF, I guess they, they gravitate towards this place and like live there and set up little communes and stuff. There was a show uh, that was like ancillary to breaking bad. It was called um, better call Saul. I think, I don't know if you're yeah. familiar with this. Yeah, that's right. And his brother was one of these people in the, towards the end of that show that like, wears like a literal tinfoil hat he's got like a little faraday blanket that he wears around and like no one's allowed to have their phones anywhere near him and stuff Uh, i always thought that was fascinating because it dovetails sort of with a concept of like targeted individuals have you ever heard of targeted individuals before yes so it, it feels like a less specific version of target individuals yeah i mean for me i'm like i'm you know i don't need to run out into away from everything but you know when there is i notice some of that stuff sometimes especially bluetooth and uh invisible dog things and old school tvs all all three of those i definitely notice and don't like (laughs) things i don't like yeah so now you know i can watch things a lot more than i used to be able to which i guess is good for doing too much podcasting (laughs) And I do to need time. to give a shout out to the Doug movie for only being like a nice tight one hour and like 10 minutes or something. Yeah. 83 minutes. Yeah. It, it is quite the sweet spot for movies. And despite this movie, not necessarily being like the, the critics choice on anyone's list, <laughs> uh, it does move along pretty well. And especially towards the end of the movie, if anything, it's like they start cramming a lot of stuff going in, like the ro- the mech robot and dressing the monster up and the military and the post office, like all this stuff is going on. And there's also all these like subplots that are getting resolved. And I don't know, it's it's kind of action packed to the point where like I had to stop it and rewind a couple of times. Like, wait, wh- when the hell did this subplot come into play? So uh, I guess like in a maybe in a good and bad way, but. It definitely uh, wasn't boring to me. Like if if there's any criticism about it all, it's that it doesn't necessarily hold a candle up to its former self. But I wouldn't consider this a sleeper. Like this is way better than um, uh, broomsticks and bed knobs or what? What the bed hell? Knobs and it? Door, door handles <laughs> and broomsticks and <laughs> yeah, whatever a bed knob is. Yes, like that. That one is standing out to me as being one of the more boring movies out of all the ones that we've seen. So oh, far. yeah. The, the sin of being boring, I think, is usually the worst sin a movie can commit. So <laughs> um, is there anything else in your notes you wanted to hit on? I see you got I, a little I bit mean, about the romance. I, I got to him in a very <laughs> scatterbrained way, but I think I hit all of them. The cool, The coolest ones being the George Herbert Walker Bush reference. I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be George Herbert Walker, but like the, the voice and all that. Mm-hmm. And the fact that the freaking ED-209 is in this movie, I don't know. I think it's kind of cool. There's like a RoboCop reference. There's a nod to the nematode pilot. 
Uh, it it kind of hits all of the beats that you would expect from a Doug movie. So in that in that regard, it doesn't let you down if you're going in and you want to see a Doug movie, as long as you know it's the Disney Doug. See, that's what I had a few years earlier in you. Since our cartoons were crap, they tried to make toys and market, you know, aliens and and RoboCop and Rambo to to kids, right? <laughs> And this is the this is the weird thing too, man. There was never. I mean, I'll say I don't know of any. Maybe in some market these got big, but I can't remember a single successful Doug toy or a Doug game or a Rugrats toy or a Rugrats game or a Ren and Stimpy toy or game. I know Ren and Stimpy had games, but they were all pretty crap. Like <laughs> they, uh, yeah, they were just like really bad. And I know there were action figures, but they were also more of like a hot topic like put it on your desk and don't play with it kind of thing. Mm. Like, I don't, I think that He-Man and Filmation in particular, like they had the freaking cartoon to toy pipeline on lock. Oh and yeah. That was, I don't point, remember right? a <laughs> single Nicktoon property at any point in history that ever made like Filmation style action figures. And I guess that's because Filmation started as the action figure and then turned into the cartoon. Right. Whereas these are cartoons that, didn't translate as well into the action figures, but for a good reason. I would never trade original Doug and original Rugrats for like cool Rugrats action figures. What even <laughs> is that? Who's playing with plastic babies? Those are just dolls. What's interesting that yeah, Disney has mostly swept this under the rug. I mean, they made the couple seasons. They made this movie. Apparently, the last Doug anything was made. Uh, he, he and maybe one other character appeared in something like 2002. And, press uh, that, then, press that yeah. for respects for Doug. Yeah, yeah. Doug has, has been AWOL for some time. He's he's quite retired right now. But yeah, there, there's Jim a- Jenkins is still very active on social media. I follow him on Instagram. Everyone that's watching this that cares about Doug, just go give a shout out to Jim Jenkins on Instagram and say that a cult Disney podcast sent you. He'll, <laughs> he'll probably get us taken down. Maybe not. I love I love you, Jim Jenkins. Please don't get us taken down. And he, he still apparently, I mean, is not uninterested in reviving Doug. Should that come to pass, you know, I think he wanted to have like an adult Doug with Doug's kids on the adventures, which I'm for um, man, especially if, <laughs> especially if he's got some kind of creative control in it, anything that Jim Jenkins wants to do Doug related or otherwise, I'm on board for it. The same thing for some other artists, even the earthworm Jim artist, man, what t- Doug Tencent or whatever it is like, he's on a wild, ultimate warrior style like path where he's like alienated a lot of people but man i freaking love me some earthworm jim like he (laughs) could turn full neo you know supremacist and i'd still be like yeah but earthworm jim man (laughs) um i guess we'll wrap it up for today then what's cooking in your pot uh a really big one is that a the uh, the Chaos Twins comic book, all ages comic book that's about cryptids. It's about Bigfoot and Chupacabros and a moth girl, but that is fully released now. You can get it on paranoidamerican.com. You can also go to chaostwins.com. If you're listening to this and it's still the month of March, then you can probably still get a signed copy uh, from me and Sam Tripoli. But the other really big thing is that on March 30th, uh, Sam's going to be coming to Central Florida to a place called Joke Joint. And at Joke Joint, we're going to do two different shows and a live signing. And finally, at the conclusion of those two shows, I'll start sending out all the uh, Kickstarter edition copies that were sold like in uh, January and February and the rest of this month. So that's huge, huge thing. A live freaking Paranoid American and Sam Tripoli event. That's a huge deal for me. And right on the tail end of that, um, also here in March, I think on the 22nd, which is in two weeks from when we're talking now, uh, it's on a Friday, we will be finally launching the chosenone.com issue two, which also uh, coincidentally has Sam Tripoli and a bunch of other people in it. And that's going to be a really big one. Uh, And I know that I think uh, Juan might even be the one that either introduced us or like was tangential to getting us connected through him and Mark at alt media United. So shout out to those guys. Uh, we're all just one big happy family, but that's the biggest news. Chaos twins.com, paranoid live show with freaking Sam Tripoli at the end of March. Yeah. Very hip. Um, I guess I'm going to do something slightly different today. I just, I put out 
more brainwashing music. If you'd like me to brainwash you, uh, that's at rovingsagemedia.bandcamp.com. It's mid-century modern binaural collection number five. It's in 432 hertz, and uh, it's like 25 to 30 minute long tracks, basically for like, uh, <clears throat> I like to say I, I, I made them on public transit to be listened to on public transit, but or, or elsewhere. It's my reading music. I make my own reading music. That's the thing. I'm like, this only works for me, but I'm like, well, if I know the intention behind it, then it's fine if it's brainwashing me. I'm brainwashing myself. <laughs> but if you'd like me to also Just do that don't listen to track three before track two <clears throat> do not no no you can play them any order you want there's 25 minutes well, long <laughs> if you don't want to wake up to like a house full of dead family members i'm saying <laughs> all right okay so uh yeah next time it's going to be tarzan and i'll try not to scream and piss off family members elsewhere in this house <laughs> <laughs> okay i'm a little bit less excited about tarzan just because doug is a highlight even though the doug rating of the movie might not have been high like i was i am jazzed to talk about doug anytime anywhere if anyone wants to talk about doug hit me up not jazzed for phil collins though <laughs> and all american stickers cryptids cults and killers killers we got all your favorite conspiracies all the Stickers, they'll make you smile and snicker. False flags and secret societies, all of these and more on our sticker sheets. Explore the unique with paranoid American sticker sheets. Unearth tales of cryptids, cults, and mysteries through each sticker. These won't last long. Get yours now at paranoidamerican.com. With all American stickers. Cryptids, cults, and killers, killers. We got all your favorite conspiracies. All the data and more on our sticker sheets. There are North American stickers. They'll make you smile and snicker. Sticker. False flags and secret societies. All of these and more on our sticker sheets. What the heck are you waiting for? Discover the extraordinary with paranoid American sticker sheets. From cryptids in the night cults out of sight each sticker is a unique find get yours now at paranoidamerican.com <laughs> <laughs>